Okay, good morning, Astronomy 1010. Um, welcome back to our lecture on the solar system. Um, there's been a few dif dif uh, distractions this week. We still don't know the outcome of the presidential election as of this morning, so I'm a little distracted and concerned, and you might see me clicking the refresh button on the Washington Post a few times, um, as I'm sure you're all. Hey, Bella, you want to mute that? I'll take care of it for you. Hey, does anyone else want to share video besides Sean and Frank? I mean, hey, I could do this too. Ready? Watch this. I don't feel like showing you guys stuff. How about that? All right. <laughs> does that, that wouldn't be a fun lecture, would it? Um, <clears throat> I need to interact with a few people here where I'm literally going to throw my um, laptop across the room. And I'm just gonna... um, today, we're going to be doing the second part of our lecture on the solar system. And uh, we're going to do homework number eight, which I just had to update, was causing me some frustrations a few moments ago. Um, homework eight should now be uh, available for you on Blackboard. And I've got the chapter seven handout, which we will need at the appropriate time. Uh, other announcements. Between... Uh, the election and Halloween stuff, I'm a little behind this week on grading your labs. I've been distracted, as I'm sure you can understand. But I will get to them. Uh, I'll have to do last week's stuff and this week's stuff all at once. That won't be fun, but uh, that's the nature of the biz. So uh, up to now, we've been pretty good about getting everything graded uh, on a once a week basis. But this week, there'll be a little bit of a delay just as there's a delay in finding out the results of our election, uh, so so too will there be a delay in us finding out uh, the grades for our homework. But I'm sure you guys can live with that. Uh, okay, so luckily we've got uh, the lecture points that we left off on at our last class right up here in the board. You'll remember that in our last lecture, we were taking a look at the overview of the solar system where we have um, two zones of planets. We have the terrestrial planets close to the sun. Uh, actually, let me adjust the lighting in here. That glare is helpful. So we have terrestrial planets, which are close to the sun. Um, farthest from the sun, we have these Jovian planets, the gas giants. And then there are things that don't easily fit into either category of terrestrial or Jovian. I'm talking about things like the asteroid belt. And today we'll do a homework problem on a large object. Well, large for an asteroid anyways. The king of the asteroid belt is called Ceres. And uh, in the last couple of years, we've had our first flyby of Ceres and we've imaged its surface and it looks pretty cool. Maybe we'll get to take a peek at that. You can think of Ceres as the king of the asteroids. It's not quite, um, it's not quite enough to be considered a planet. It doesn't sweep out the orbital debris of the asteroid belt and clean it up. But today we give Ceres dwarf planet status along with Pluto and Eris. So things like the asteroid belt and Ceres, Pluto, Eris, the Kuiper belt comets, the Oort cloud comets, these are things which don't fit into either category of terrestrial planet or Jovian planet. They are part of the miscellaneous debris of the solar system. And as we learn to come up with a theory of how the solar system formed, we will need to account for the fact that terrestrial planets form close to the sun, all the larger Jovians form farther from the sun, and then there's some stuff that doesn't quite fit into either one of these things. Eventually you'll learn that all of these things are related to each other. There's a reason for the way uh, each of these structures have formed. One of the best ways uh, to get to know the materials that make up the solar system is to study the density of objects. And I think that's what we're going to start with today, because that's a big concept and you're going to have a lot of final exam questions. Uh, first of all here, I guess I'm going uh, to hide the trolls. So I can focus on the people that I can interact with. Oh, hide non-video participants. There we go. Okay. Uh, let's start with a definition of density because that's going to be important to us. Uh, 
Okay. Density is a basic property of matter. It's defined as an object's mass divided by the object's volume. I'm going to use a special symbol for density, the Greek letter delta. So I don't have to write out density every time. Delta will stand for density in this class. And typically, we are considering in this class the density. Uh, actually, I got an idea. First, let's talk about units. Can you guys tell me what the MKS units of density would be? I know you guys know the MKS system because otherwise you'd be totally ignorant of science and not worthy of this class, right? I wouldn't want to be even teaching students who didn't know what the MKS system was. Is it kilogram? Ah, uh, that would be for mass. What about for volume? You guys know about volume, right? Like length times width times height. Meter? Well, meters would be the MKS unit of length. What would be the MKS unit of width? Height? Wouldn't it be meters cubed? Yeah, it's meters cubed. They're all meters, they're all lengths, right? Kilograms per cubic meter would be your traditional MKS units of density. But it turns out that if you think about this, measuring measuring densities in kilograms per cubic uh, meter is not exactly helpful. Suppose, for instance, you wanted to determine the density of a substance like lead. You would need to have a cube of lead that was basically the size of this board if it was a, if it was a cube, right? So this is a square meter. Um, oh, here's the cubic meter. A cubic meter is too big for me to, to show you on my uh, laptop camera here, but a cubic meter would be comparable to, well, almost like a, a mini fridge or something. You wouldn't wanna have to carry a mini fridge worth of lead around your laboratory. Because of this, chemists and other such people who actually have to go about measuring densities, instead, the preferred units, uh, can't spell preferred, let's try this, preferred units of densities would be grams per cubic centimeter. And that's because a cubic centimeter is, I don't know, it's about, it's about a volume of a cubic centimeter is about the size of a chicken bouillon cube, or um, maybe even, yeah, I can't find it though. Well, basically uh, the size of a, of a small die, which I used to have around for demonstration, but I, I seem to have lost. In any case, Cubic centimeters are much more uh, reasonable sizes to measure densities in. It might be useful for you guys to remember your conversions from kilograms to grams, from centimeters to meters. So uh, remember that one kilogram is equal to a thousand grams. That's a helpful conversion factor. Remember that um, a meter contains a uh, hundred centimeters. Also, don't forget that most of the time when we measure planets, we're measuring their radii in kilometers. A kilometer is a thousand meters. It'll turn out to be very helpful to have a conversion from kilometers to centimeters. Can you guys work that out for me using dimensional analysis? Um, Cam, you're my favorite dimensional analysis expert. 
Why don't you help me convert kilometers into centimeters using your dimensional analysis technique? Sure thing. Just let me write down the notes. Sure, sure. Okay, so of course you write down the number to convert with, with its units, so. Uh, what am I trying to convert? Uh, grams and centimeters, so. Nope. Uh, kilometers? Two. Two meters. Not exactly, I've already got the conversion for that. Oh, okay, so, so grams? You can't convert kilometers to grams because kilometers measure length, grams measure mass. Okay. Does anyone remember what I just said a moment ago, what I was trying to convert? Yeah, to converting a kilometer is to centimeters. Thank you, Bella. Uh, that's, that's what it is, okay. Okay, Cam, we're working our way to centimeters, so set us up here. Okay, so kilometers would be, okay, so, so it says to write down the number to convert with the, with the units. So what number do I want to write down? So you would want one kilometer. Okay, boom, I did that. Now what do I do? You put, uh, you also write down centimeters. Nope, that wasn't one oh. of the instructions. This is step one oh. of dimensional analysis. Let's move on to step two. Okay, so you multiply by the division bar. Okay, that's step two. Now let's go to step three. Um, put units in first to cancel. Okay, that's your job. Okay, so kilometers would be at the bottom. Right. And then meters would go on top. Very good. What's step four? Uh, you mul uh, you multiply again. Well, that's step two. Or, that's okay. that. Yeah, that's why I meant step two. Multiply by the division bar. Okay. And then meters that go in the bottom, and then you have and then centimeters that go on top. All right. Let's keep her moving. So now do step four. And step four is to put numbers in second using any conversion factors. Here's your conversion factors. Put the number um, Okay. So 1,000 meters. One kilometer. 100 centimeters. One meter. Okay. And you get 100,000 centimeters, I think. How do I write 100,000 in, um, in scientific notation, Cam? Um, one times 10 to the fifth. Very good. And I'm gonna suppress the one and just write it as 10 to the fifth centimeters. Cam okay. has just helped us find a very, very important conversion factor. And I guessed that all in my head with the multiplying. One kilometer is 10 to the five centimeters. That's an important conversion factor. Important. Okay. This will help you on your test. It will help you answer questions quickly. There's a reason I'm giving this to you. When you're done copying this, I'm going to erase. Sean, I hope you're writing all this stuff down. It's very important. Okay, okay. Matt, you good? I'm gonna erase. So it turns out, in terms of density, most objects, most lumps of rock which exceed 
about 500 kilometers in diameter will self deform into a sphere due to their own gravitational pressure squeezing them on all sides. And you'll notice that for objects smaller than 500 kilometers, which usually consist of asteroids or very small moons, you will not always find lumps of rock in space in a spherical shape. One classic example is an asteroid known as Eros. Eros is legendary for being a bone-shaped asteroid. I was hoping to find another picture of it here. Oh, come on. Oh. Mm. Well, that's not as helpful as I was hoping. Yeah, here we go. This is the asteroid known as Eros. It's famously kind of a potato like dog bone or something. It's, it's clearly not spherical in its dimensions, but that's because Eros is quite small. Um, I don't know what they have for, for the length of it. They put it in miles like lay masses. Um, dimensions, it's about 16 kilometers. Oh, here we go. 34 by 11 by 11 kilometers. So it's clearly smaller than 500 kilometers, but most objects in our solar system um, that exceed uh, 500 kilometers, which are typical for planets and moons, they're gonna self deform into a sphere. So it's helpful to have an equation for the density of a sphere. Uh, remember that spheres look like this. They have a radius like so. Um, the volume and the surface area of a sphere are well known from a geometry class. Usually you prove this in your mathematics class that the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. We're going to need that at some point in the next week or so, so I'm putting it down now. The volume of a sphere famously is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Notice that the surface area goes as the square of the radius. The volume transforms as the cube of the radius, which makes sense from a unit's perspective. We're going to go ahead and we're going to plug the volume into the formula for density. And the 4 thirds on the bottom will flip a 3 up on top and we get a formula for the density of a sphere. The density of a sphere is three times the mass of the sphere over four pi r cubed. That's a key formula that you're going to need many times on your final exam. We're going to start off by doing a practice problem. Uh, we're going to find the density of Earth. So I'm going to erase some stuff up here. Find the density of Earth. And the two givens that we're going to work with are the mass of the Earth, 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms, and the radius of Earth, 6,400 kilometers. What should I do to start? Plug your values into the formula? That would be a bad idea, Jake. Okay. Do you know what do you know why that would be a bad idea? 
I guess not. Otherwise, you wouldn't have suggested it. It's got to do with units, buddy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The what units. units do we, what units do we want for density? Oh, shit. <laughs> I can't remember nothing. Grams and centimeters? Right. Oh, so yeah. that, that suggests we're going to have to start by convert kilograms to grams and kilometers to centimeters. Ah, geez, how would I do that? Not meters, Ava, centimeters. How would I do that? How would I do such a thing? I can't remember anything. I can't remember what I had for breakfast. I can't remember my name. I'm just forgetting all the time. What would I, what would I do? How could anyone be expected to do such a thing? I'm just gonna sit here and scratch my head until I get an idea. Any ideas? Dimensional analysis. Oh, that's an idea. Yeah, great idea. Okay, Jake, you're up. Which one do yeah, you want to do? I didn't want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Which one do you want to do, Jake? Um, 6,400 kilometers. Okay. Centimeters. Okay. So, so 6,400 kilometers times a division bar. Yep. And then you'd put kilometers on bottom. So since we got like the new conversion yes. centimeters, should we use that? Yes. Okay, so 10 to the fifth centimeters on top or? Yep. And what do I put in the bottom? And one on bottom. Right. Can you do this in your head? Would it be? Six million? Uh, not six million. Billion. Just count your zeros, count your decimal places. It's gonna be 6.4 times 10 to the something, right? To the seventh, right? Five. Eight. Six, seven, eight. Sean, my friend, where'd you go? Oh, there you are. Sean, it's time for you to make up for some lost time, for some sins that you've committed against astronomy 1010, okay? okay? So it's time for you to do a conversion. It's time for you to go kilograms to grams. Uh, do you have your four steps of dimensional analysis written down somewhere? Yeah. Okay, call them up or maybe you just know what to do. I don't know. Help well, me convert six times 10 to the 24 kilograms to grams. Well, we're going to start by uh, right now, six times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Excellent. Multiply that by a division bar. Excellent. Then you're going to put kilograms on the bottom uh -huh. and grams on top. Uh huh. And then a thousand over one. Jeez, it's like you've been here this whole time. This is great. Okay, can you do this in your head? Yeah, it's uh, six times 10 to the 27th. Very good. Nicely done, sir. Nicely done. Okay, cool. So now we've got our units in the right place. And now, Jake, we can plug in. They call it plug and chug when you plug into the formula. Okay. Now it's time to plug and chug. So I guess I'll set it up down here. For the density of Earth, we have three times six times 10 to the 27 grams divided by four times pi times uh, 6.4 times 10 to the eight centimeters cubed thereof. Okay, take out your calculators and punch it and crunch it while I adjust the temperature settings in my apartment. Oh, uh, 70, just under 70 maybe. I was cold this morning and now I'm warm. You guys have got me all hot and bothered with your conversions there. 
Thank you. Okay, guys, punch it up and crunch it up. Well, I furiously refresh WashingtonPost.com uh, to see who's winning the election. What do we got? Come on, baby. That's good. Okay, what do you guys think? You should all try to punch this in. I'm talking to all you trolls there in the background because as Jake just discovered, it's very easy to get the wrong answer. Uh, Frank, you're off by a tiny bit. Bella, a little closer. Closer, Bella. Bella, you got it. Matt, you got it. It's very easy to screw this up. Or it could be a chicken sandwich, or an Italian bread, or something, something fun to eat. All right, um, Cam, we're still doing it wrong. Let me tell you what I think is going on, Cam. We have to divide by four, divide by pi, and divide by that. So let's watch me do it, okay? So uh, I'm trying to see the equation and punch. So three times six exp27 divide by four divide by pi divide by 6.4 exp8 shift cube and then equals what's my final answer okay but say it can say it loud say it proud so we've got 5.5. Excellent. And the units? Centimeters? Mm, a little more complicated than that. Oh, grams per centimeters. Cube. Grams per cubic centimeter. Right. This famously is the average density of Earth. Earth has the highest density of any planet in our solar system. We are the densest planet in our solar system, which has become all too clear after last night. The densest planet in the solar system, okay? Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> listen, uh, what does that mean? Probably not a lot to you guys, because you've never really thought about density before and you don't have any basis of comparison. We're gonna talk about the ingredients that make a solar system. And we're gonna look at the density of the different sort of mixtures. Suppose we had like a little Bisquick box, except instead of Bisquick, it said the solar system. And we were an all powerful deity who is creating a solar system from scratch, just like you make some pancakes or something. Um, what kind of ingredients would we find in uh, as we make up our solar system? Well, it would not, sorry, my, File Explorer is going slow here. Uh, let's open this formation. formation of the solar system. Um, to do this, we have to talk a little bit about how the solar system is formed. Let's start with, do you guys know how old the solar system is? No? It actually appeared in our homeworks last week, but uh, can I erase this? Does anyone still need this? So let's 
what I want to do is I want to talk about um, I want to talk about the densities of but, cool. I'm trying to I'm trying to be learning here. <laughs> um, the densities of typical planetary ingredients. And uh, the typical ingredients, to, to understand what the typical ingredients are that make up a solar system, you first have to understand a little bit about the formation of the solar system. So this is going to give me a little tangent or a mini quest here, a mini game of talking about the formation of the solar system. The leading theory of the formation of the solar system is known as the nebular theory of solar system formation. And we're going to define that. The idea is that if you could go back 4.6 billion years ago, the solar system would have, as it, as it formed, it would have looked a little something like this. You would have had a newborn star surrounded by a swirling disk of dusty debris, dusty gas. And this dusty gas would have formed from the collapse of a massive nebula. So let's go ahead and, uh, Let's call up the nebular theory. We'll, we'll keep that guy on ice over there so I can look at that. Um, let's look at uh, nebular theory. It used to be called the nebular hypothesis, but now it's been elevated to the concept of a theory. I really like this picture, but I want to see if I can get a high, high res version. Oh, that's not so bad. This is, this is the sort of time lapse image that I like to look at here. At one point, uh, as you can see up here, there would have been a giant nebula of, of hydrogen and helium gas with little bits of dusty debris in it. And gravity would have begun to collapse this cloud, this singular cloud. And as it collapsed, the cloud would begin to rotate and it would begin to flatten. And some material would begin to in spiral towards what will later become the sun. This disk will be very warm, and as little bits of rock and debris collide with each other, some of the material will sort of settle into the central star. The rest will have too much spin to fall into the star, too much angular momentum, and it will settle into a disk. And eventually this disk will coalesce into lanes and clumps, which eventually end up uh, condensing due to their own gravitational interactions into planets. So we go from here, a single collapsing cloud to a nice, neat, tidy solar system with a central star and eight planets and some other bits of debris floating around. Let's write that down as a statement because that's something we want to remember. The nebular theory suggests that the solar system formed Four point six million years ago from a single collapsing, and here's the key idea from a single collapsing homogeneous cloud. of what I will call dirty hydrogen and helium gas. This is the leading theory of our solar system's formation. That the solar system formed 4.6 billion years ago from a single collapsing homogeneous cloud of dirty hydrogen and helium gas.
one of the reasons this has been elevated to the status of theory, it's not just a hypothesis or a guess, is because we have a lot of evidence suggesting other solar systems form in the same way. We've actually imaged baby solar systems forming using infrared telescopes like the Spitzer Space Telescope. Let me show you a new Scrabble word that you might find kind of fun. The word is called proplid, and it's a portmanteau word, which is a contraction of protoplanetary disk. If you type proplid into Google, what comes up are hundreds and hundreds of images of little baby solar systems, just like this one, forming from a collapsing cloud of dirty hydrogen and helium gas. Come on, buddy. Um, there we go. Open image new tab. You see that? Now, the images of low resolution, because this solar system is forming far away, and we're looking at infrared wavelengths, which are harder to resolve. But what you can see here is the central protostar, which will later undergo fusion and become a proper star. Can you guys see that little black speck next to it? That's the disk. That's the little baby solar system forming. And this is the leftover part of the cloud from which it was uh, contracting. We don't just have one image of protoplanetary disks forming from, from collapsing clouds. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. All of the pictures that you see in this image are, I believe, Hubble Space Telescope images of baby solar systems forming. Don't It's kind of cute. They look like little tiny tadpoles. I'd like to point out in particular a couple that I think are interesting. Look at this one here. You can actually see it's an edge on view where you can see the central protostar and you can actually see the little disk of gas forming the baby solar system. Sometimes the star actually is hidden from view because the cloud is so thick or sometimes you'll just see the disk or sometimes you'll actually just see the jets that look like little tadpoles. These are caused by charged particles spinning along magnetic fields. Usually when stars first form, they have really, really powerful leftover magnetic fields. And the magnetic fields are like slingshots that fling charged particles into the surrounding gas and kind of make them glow. Um, I don't have time to explain this whole damn thing to you, but I'm just showing you that we have images of other solar systems forming from these, these nebulae, right? So this isn't something we're guessing about. We have a lot of evidence. Now, when I talk about the dirty composition of hydrogen and helium gas, typically the composition of one of these nebulae is very, very similar to the composition of the sun, uh, if not identical. And that means usually the composition is 70% hydrogen, 28% helium. 1% is usually in the form of ices, which could be elements like water or um, uh, methane, ammonia, and even carbon dioxide. These are the kind of things you'd find in the ISIS category. And the remaining 1%, which is sometimes called dust, could be little bits of rocks and metal grains, small solid grains of rock and metal. They could be gaseous too. But that's typically the composition of your protosolar nebula. And by the way, the planets will then form from some mixture of these things. Weirdly, the hydrogen and helium tend to always go together because hydrogen and helium are so light, so volatile, that you either end up with one or two scenarios. As a planet starts to form, either it becomes massive enough to capture both hydrogen and helium, or if it's a little too small in size and light and mass, it won't be able to capture the hydrogen and the helium like Jupiter did, but instead will form from some mixture of this stuff, okay? These are what we want to know the densities of because these will tell us 
where our planet formed in the solar system and, and how it formed from this nebular hypothesis. Okay, so uh, take a second to finish that because I need to erase it. I'd like to point out before I give you the densities of these objects, that density is a tracer of chemical composition. And to demonstrate that, I'd like to share with you my favorite periodic table of the elements, the Sergeant Welsh periodic table. So periodic table of elements, Sergeant Welsh. That's the one that I used when I was a chemistry student. Uh, I, I actually still have it right over there in my, uh, in my table. We'll be using this one going forward. I want to get a high res version here. Oh yeah, this is 3000 pixels. That's what we want. So let's uh, open that image in a new tab. And I want you guys to look at this here. The Sergeant Welsh periodic table of the elements is packed full of all kinds of fascinating information about, uh, about elements, okay? So you'll see here in the legend that it has the atomic number, the average atomic mass. Uh, I'm just trying to move some of these things. The average atomic mass is here. Um, they have oxidation states and electron configurations, but this is what I'm here to show you. The density measured at 300 Kelvin, which is close to room temperature in grams per cubic centimeter. Zinc has a density of around seven grams per cubic centimeter. And that's very typical of metals. Metals tend to be around seven grams per cubic centimeter. But I want you guys to notice that if you look close, each element has a slightly different density. Zirconium, for instance, might be 6.5 grams per cubic centimeter, but niobium is 8.9 grams per cubic centimeter. And molybdenum is a bit more heavy at 10 grams per cubic centimeter. Each element hardly, basically no two elements have the same density. That's because they have different numbers of protons and neutrons in their nuclei. But whatever, the point I'm trying to make is density is a measurement of chemical composition because each unique density specifies a unique element. That's good because if we know the densities of the planets, we get our first clue as to what they are made out of in their interiors. So let's go ahead and list the table of common densities. We're going to erase this. Okay. So let's make us a table. of common densities. And you guys will want to accidentally, sorry, you guys will want to accidentally memorize this. And we'll list the substances that form planets. This will be the density in grams per centimeter cubed. Okay. Let's start with a mixture of hydrogen and helium gas. And in particular, we want a mixture which is weighted 70% hydrogen and 28% helium. Uh, because helium is more massive than hydrogen, that basically means nine hydrogen atoms for every one helium atom. And if you look at our periodic table of the elements, hydrogen and helium are the lightest uh, or the least dense materials. So hydrogen is 0 0.9 grams per cubic centimeter, whereas helium, let me move you guys, is maybe 0 0.2 grams per cubic centimeter. Since we're a little bit close, we have more hydrogen than helium, we're going to round the two of them together to be a tenth, roughly a tenth of a gram per cubic centimeter. And that's because we're weighting it 
quite a bit more towards hydrogen than we are towards helium. Um, the next thing that we can make planets out of are things like ices. And ices include a mixture of water, methane, ammonium, and CO2. We sometimes refer to these things as hydrogen ices. So I'm going to call them H ices. What makes water, methane, and ammonia similar is they both have low melting and sublimation points. So they can very quickly go from ice to gas in the proto-solar nebula, depending on how close they drift to the star. Um, by definition, water has a density of one gram per cubic centimeter. And that's typical of the other elements as well. I'm guessing there are slight differences, but they're close. Uh, let me just, you know, I've never actually thought to, I don't know off the top of my head what the density of uh, ammonium is. But I'd like to know. I'm guessing Wikipedia would have that information, right? No. Huh. Why not? That's weird. Well, there's something I don't understand there. We're going to go with one gram per cubic centimeter. Um, then we have stuff like, like this. Granite is an example of planetary rock. Now, granite is a mixture of different minerals. But when you smush them all together, a block of granite or a block of basaltic lava, rocks typically have a density of three grams per cubic centimeter. And that's a rough, loose number. So rock, and we can define rock next time, three grams per cubic centimeter. Um, most of the cores of planets are made of a mixture of iron and nickel. And this is a piece of a fragment of a meteoroid, uh, or a meteorite rather, this is a meteorite that created the massive crater in Arizona known as Meteor Crater. Um, I love handing this around the class, which I obviously can't do to you guys, because you really don't, you get, it's hard to get a sense of just how dense this is until you hold it in your hand and you feel its weight. Um, but this melted metal is an example of a mixture of iron and nickel, which we believe to be in the cores. You can see little pockets of rust there, uh, in the cores of planets. You wouldn't want to get hit in the head with this thing. Um, things like that, iron and nickel, metal, similar to what we saw for zinc around seven grams per cubic centimeter so the way this game is played is we take the density of a planet like earth so if earth has a density of five grams per cubic centimeter what does that tell us about the composition of earth class That it has more of a density than rock and less than metal. Or in other words, Bella, it must be made up of. Rock and metal in between. That's right. It's a mixture of rock and metal. Let's try this in the other direction. Pluto is different than a terrestrial planet and different from a Jovian planet in that Pluto is a mixture of ice and rock. Pluto is a mixture of ice and rock. 
What would you guys anticipate the density of Pluto to be? Two grams oh. per cubic centimeters. Um, Jake, can you say that one more time? Because I, I missed it. Two grams per cubic centimeters. And you would be correct. Exactly, Jake. This is why densities are so important. Um, Jake, just to prove that you your intuition was correct, let's look at the let's look at the higher precision value here. I'm gonna type Pluto into Wikipedia and hope it comes up with the planet. Uh, here's a picture of Pluto, in case you haven't seen it before. This is a lump of ice and rock, very little metal at this distance from the sun. And the density you'll notice is 1.9 grams per cubic centimeter, Jake, pretty much exactly what you predicted, okay? And you'll find that's true of other objects that are out in the Kuiper belt. This is why we don't really classify Pluto as a terrestrial planet. Terrestrial planets are usually made of rock and metal. Things like Pluto and Eris, they're rock and ice. Asteroids in general tend to be a bit more rocky than, uh, than Pluto. So you would anticipate the density of an asteroid to be close to three grams per cubic centimeter. You will discover that that is not always true. But let's take a look at Ceres real quick. I told you guys that Ceres was the king of the asteroids and it would be kind of cool to show you a picture of Ceres. We recently uh, imaged it during uh, uh, an orbital flyby. So notice that Ceres is just about large enough to self-deform into a sphere, although it's not a perfect sphere. And this is what it looks like. Those shiny patches that you see on the surface are probably small bits of ice. Uh, wait, how do I get out of this picture now? Let's go back. Uh, let's check out the... Whoops. Let's check out the density of this bad boy. What does it mean that the density of Pluto, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, let me try this again. The density of Ceres is 2.2 .2 grams per cubic centimeter. I guess there's, there's two meanings. One is it could have a bit of ice in there besides rock. The other concept is that it may be that because these asteroids are so small in mass that they don't have enough gravity to compress the rock to the extremes that rocks on Earth are compressed. Don't forget that the granite on Earth is under a tremendous gravitational pressure from the mass of Earth. These asteroids are not squeezed as hard as Earth is. And so some of them are literally like a pile of rubble or bits of rock that are all mashed together. And we've seen this in close up inspections of some asteroids that they almost appear to be something like a rubble pile. Okay, let's do one more table here. For the purposes of this class, here's how we're going to roll. We're going to, so I'm going to change my table now from common densities to a table of, let's call them planetary or moon densities. And what would you guys expect the density of a gas giant to be? like Jupiter or Saturn. What would you guys expect the density of a Jovian planet to be? less than one gram per cubic centimeter? In some cases you would be right, but um, 
usually they're really close to one. So you are correct, Jake, if you're talking about Saturn. Uh, famously, the joke goes that if you had a lake big enough, Saturn would float in that lake because Saturn is the only planet whose density is under that of water. Although you'll notice that it's, it's still pretty close. Um, the density is 0 0.7 grams per cubic centimeter. On the other hand, if you look at uh, Jupiter, the sort of king of the, uh, the Jovian planets, Jupiter has an average density of, uh, wow, what a bunch of lame asses. Now they're changing their units to kilograms per cubic meter. It turns out that 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter is the same as 1.3 grams per cubic centimeter when you do the conversion right. So Jupiter is just a little bit over water. That's because the center of Jupiter is highly compressed rock, metal, and ice. The outer layers are gas, but there's so much pressure that it just kind of averages out to one. So here's a good rule of thumb. This is why we should talk about this. And then here's a terrestrial planet. It doesn't quite fit into these perfect categories, but Jovians typically have densities of one gram per cubic centimeter, okay? Pluto and icy moons often have a density of two grams per cubic centimeter. Asteroids can be as low as two, but for asteroids and rocky moons, just, just for your first learning exercise, we're gonna assume that things that are made of rock are made of three grams per cubic centimeter and terrestrials are usually around five grams per cubic centimeter. This is a very important table because I'm gonna ask you to classify planets as terrestrial, Jovian, or something like this on your final exam. I'm not gonna make you do it once. I'm not gonna make you do it twice. I'm gonna make you do it at least three times on the final exam. So watch out for that. Before we do our homework, um, I'd like to spend the last few minutes of class, last 15 minutes or so, just having you guys learn some basic facts about the solar system, which I think will help us in our lectures going forward. Also, it just oh. gives me a chance to show you guys some cool photos of planets. Make sure you Can get I this table. A... Oh yeah, Andy, what? Can I take a picture of this note real quick? The yeah, notes. sure. I'll get a couple I came of in kind of light because I had a quiz. My last class. Oh, yeah. Why did you join us? Did you have some computer issues today or something, Andy? Or no, I had a class and I had a quiz and you put it on late. Like oh, it was. I understand. Right well, luckily this has been recorded, so you can you can watch later. You basically just missed us calculating densities. That's it. All right. Although that right. lecture uh, bit is worth going back and watching, I think. Yeah, I'm gonna do that later. I got some iced tea. So let's see what you guys know about the solar system. There's things, there's always more to learn about the solar system. Um, what's the biggest planet? Oh, Cam says, what's the density of the mixture of ice and rock? Uh, uh, two grams per cubic centimeter. Pluto and icy moons are made up of uh, ice and rock. In our solar system, moons can either be rocky, like our own moon, or moons can be icy, like the moons of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Maybe one of my favorite examples, just to show you guys something awesome for fun, my favorite icy moon in the entire solar system is a moon called Iapetus. It's a moon of Saturn. And I just want to show you the picture of Iapetus. That's why I'm telling you about it or Iapetus, I hope I'm saying this right. 
they have the pronunciation there. Iapetus is probably how I should have said it. Look at this thing. Look how nasty that is. You see this bad boy right here? Um, it's hard to see in this picture, but it actually has a seam along the equator. This moon is, because it's made of, of ice, and it, well, because of other features of it, it's, it's not in hydrostatic equilibrium, and it's actually crushing itself along the equator. But all of that white stuff that you see, that's all water, ice. That's just water, ice. Look, and the rest of the dark green blotches are kind of like, uh, well, they're, it's a type of dirt. <laughs> it's a sort of dirty, uh, dusty material. Famously, Iapetus has a two-toned structure with a bright side on the left and a dark side on the right. And here's something really interesting. That dark side of the moon, the dark side is the side that's moving forward through space. So if you think about it, the moon is doing this, right? And the dark side is the one that's in the leading side, I believe. The idea of what happens there is the, the moon is a mixture of rock and ice, right? I'm sorry, yeah, like rocky stuff and icy stuff. The sun is continuously beating on one surface and it's heating up the ice and sublimating it. And as the ice blows across the surface to the other side, it leaves a little bit of dirt, but the dirt is dark. And you guys know what happens to like pavement in the summer, right? It warms up. So the dirty stuff gets even more warm and melts even more ice. And it becomes a positive feedback loop that keeps blowing more and more ice over to the other side. And it keeps getting one surface continuously darker than the other. So over billions of years of just orbiting around uh, Saturn and pointing towards the sun, one surface has gotten really dark and covered in soot. And the other side is covered in ice. You can even see the impact craters are not very clean. And that's because they've been worn down through wind erosion of all the jets of gas blowing across the surface. Look how those craters have been chipped away by icy winds blowing across the surface. Very cool stuff. Anyways, I wanted to show you that this stuff is interesting because you look at some of these moons and you don't realize just how much ice is there. Another cool example of an icy moon would be uh, Enceladus. You'll learn more about this uh, at a later point. This is another moon of Saturn. And it's famous for having these cool features called the tiger stripes. And those are basically just melted water ice. Um, a very, very beautiful moon that's worth learning about. Um, and so we are going to talk about Enceladus. But I just wanted to show you that sometimes when you see these images, it's not always obvious that you're looking at icy structures. But these, these can be very icy. So what about the rest of the planets in our solar system? Do you guys know what's the biggest planet in terms of radius? Would it be Neptune? Not Neptune. I wonder if we have a table of planetary data. The book in chapter seven has a table of planetary data. And Jupiter? Yeah, that's right. Jupiter does. Let's close this out here. Oh, actually, let's keep that. We might want that later. We'll close this one instead. What's the smallest planet? We can't clue Pluto anymore because it's not a planet. Of the planet. Mercury is the smallest planet. Let's see if we can get a table of planetary data. I want to show you guys a couple of cool things. What's the hottest planet in the solar system? The Mars. sun. Well, the sun's not a planet, so that's not fair, right? Mars. Mars is not the warmest planet in our solar Venus. system. Mercury. You'd think it's Mercury, but it's not. Saturn. Nope. I think someone Venus. said Venus. I think that's right. That's right. It's Venus. That's right. Um, let's look at, so a very sciencey thing to do is to kind of look at a table of data and try to figure out what the hell is going on. Um, <clears throat> let's start with their, oh, I hate that they're showing us diameters. This is a lame ass table. What we want are radii, masses, surface temperatures. 
the book has an this is the one from our book so let's go with this one if ah oh, shoot it's too low res i know a lot of you guys don't didn't buy the book so hmm. oh actually i've got an idea sometimes if you click on that it'll show you related images open link in new tab I just want one that has temperature as well as rotation. Mm, this is okay. Come on, baby. Oh, where, where, oh, here we go. Okay, so let's look at the relative sizes of the planets first. I want you guys to notice that if you do it by radius, Jupiter is the biggest, okay, followed by Saturn. Uranus and Neptune are almost the same, but check this out. If you round it to two sig figs, Uranus is 26,000 kilometers, where Neptune is 25,000 kilometers. So they're almost the same size, but Uranus is a little bit bigger. But look if you do it by mass. Unfortunately here, they didn't do it in kilograms. They did it in Earth mass equivalents. Neptune is 17 times more massive than the Earth. Uranus is 15 times more massive than the Earth. That means Neptune is the third most massive planet, but the fourth biggest planet. In other words, Uranus is bigger, Neptune is more massive. They don't always go hand in hand. Can you guys think of a reason why Neptune would not have a larger radius than Uranus? despite the fact that Neptune is more massive than Uranus? Why would Neptune have a smaller radius even though it's more massive? I mean, that's not how it works with Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter is significantly more massive than Saturn and its radius is a bit bigger. So why doesn't it work that way for Uranus and Neptune? There's a very obvious answer if you can think about it. And it's got something Neptune to do- Neptune more dense? Yes, Neptune is more dense, but why would Neptune be more dense? They're both made of the same composition, hydrogen and helium gas and ices. Why would Neptune be denser than Uranus when it has the same chemical composition? That kind of goes against everything we just learned about. Well, what if I told you that Uranus is 20 AU from the sun, but Neptune is 30 AU from the sun? What would the distance from the sun have to do with how dense these planets are? The answer is that they are balls of gas. And Neptune being 10 AU further away is going to be colder and the gas will contract more. So the distance from the sun is what causes that, plus the, the temperature. And yes, to answer our earlier question, Venus is the hottest planet. Um, it's even hotter than Mercury because of the greenhouse effect. So let's talk about some funky things in our solar system like that, okay? So in our solar system, there are some cool quirks that are worth no notice, noticing. Um, first of all, Venus is the hottest planet. And it's hotter than Mercury because of its so-called runaway greenhouse effect. There's another interesting thing about Venus. Venus is the slowest rotating planet and the only planet that rotates a little bit backwards or clockwise. Venus rotates extremely slow and backwards. 
compared to the other planets. In fact, as we'll see, the length of a day on Venus, let's see if we can get that table up again. Oh, rotation period. Venus is 243 days. But the length of a year on Venus, unfortunately, a Venusian year, they put this in years, is 0.7. Wait, let me try that again. Oh, yeah, no, they put it in days. But the orbital period, a year, is 225 days. What does that mean, class? It's a day is longer than a year, than its year. It's the uh, its day is longer than its year, which is w wild to think about, right? A day on Venus. Is longer. Than a year. As we just saw other fun quirks of the solar system. Uranus and Neptune are sort of like twins, but Uranus is slightly bigger in terms of radius, whereas Neptune is slightly more massive. In fact, Uranus and Neptune are sometimes differentiated from the other gas giants. They are sometimes called ice giants because they have higher concentrations of methane and ammonia and water ices. Okay, those are just a couple of quick fun facts that I think will be useful to know in the future. Um, it's 1247. What do you say we take our break a little early today? I'm going to refresh the Washington Post while I stare at my coffee. And um, then around 105 or so, we'll start homework number eight, which is chapter seven problems. That's a, that's a short and very easy homework that shouldn't take us too much time, which I'm sure everyone will be happy. What's about. the homework again? Chapter seven? Uh, yeah, and it's homework number eight. I had to update it before class, which was causing me some grief. So right here, if you go to your homework section, Andy, you'll see the questions and you'll, uh, you'll have the PDF so that you can read the problems. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So let's take a 15, 20 minute break. I'll pause the recording and we'll come back then to do the work. Okay. All right. Okay, everyone, what do you say we try to knock this homework out quick and dirty? That way I can get back to nervously refreshing my uh, election results on the browser there <clears throat> and worrying about the future. So why don't we uh, take a look at our homework? It's uh, homework number eight, problems from chapter seven. Um, I'm going to put them up on the board. We'll do all the usual things that we do uh, when we do a homework. We will put our name. We will put AS 1010 and our section. This is homework number eight, chapter seven, number 40, 44. 45, 46, and 49, I believe, if memory serves us correct. So for chapter seven, we'll want to begin with question number 40. Andrew, why don't you read us uh, question 40 if you've got the 
problems in front right. of you. Um, what is it, chapter seven, question 40. Okay. Um, comparing planetary conditions, use both table 7.1 appendix E to answer each of the following. Which column of data would you use to find out which planet has the shortest days? Are there any notable differences in the length of a day for the different types of planets? Explain. Okay, so let's see if we still have that um, chapter seven uh, chart up and running. I think they're referring to this one. Um, can I look at this? I guess I can't, can't easily zoom in on that. Okay, weird. So which of these columns tells us the length of a day? Rotation period. That's right, the rotation period. And what do we notice? Um, do you notice any big trends if you compare the different types of planets? Because I, so a question is, a science question is, can you look at a table of random numbers and find the non-randomness in it? Can you look at these numbers and take away a conclusion quickly? And can you filter out the big idea from the noise? <clears throat> You've got your rotation period. Are there any meaningful differences between the different types of planets? Well, Mercury and Venus have orbital periods that are less than a year, and it takes them a long time to rotate. <clears throat> but okay. Earth, Earth is just under 24 hours, and everything else is less than a day, minus Mars, but that's just barely over. Well, Mars and Earth basically have the same rotation period, 24 hours. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to look at the seventh decimal place there they both have a rotation period of about 24 hours yeah and how does that compare to say jupiter and saturn uh it's quite a bit longer yeah so could you make any blunt statement about jovians versus terrestrials The Jovians are the the closer ones, right? No. no. Okay. So the, no, no. the, are, the Jovian is ones. Of, this is this the, is Jovian versus terrestrial, right? You might have missed that. Oh, that's Jovian. That's terrestrial. I just forgot. I got it mixed up. Okay. So but, what are the what are the differences between rotations for Jovians versus rotations for terrestrials? They're much shorter. Yes. Okay. The column is the rotation period. And the takeaway is Jovian planets have much shorter days than terrestrials or let's just say rotations, rotation periods than terrestrials. And in particular, Venus is really, really slow. Okay, Andy, part B. I'm just copying the rest of that. That's down. fine. Take your time.
Okay, part B. All right. Part B. Oh. All right, I got it. Um, which column of data would you use to find out which planet should have seasons? Explain. Can you guys guess which column? This is something you should know from our first week's lecture. The axis tilt? That's right. Based on the analysis, which planets should not have any seasonal variations? I'll give you a hint, there's three. Which planets do not have seasons? The, um, what do you call it? The Jovians. No, not true. Mercury. Mercury won't have seasons, who else? Jupiter. Jupiter won't have seasons. One more. Saturn. Nope. Mars. Uranus. Nope, nope. Venus. That's right. 180 degrees is almost the same as, is basically is the same as zero degree axis tilt because you're flipped upside down. So the answer is axis tilt. And we discovered that Mercury, Venus, and Jupiter do not have seasons. Their temperature might be different from North Pole to, to the equator, but they don't change over the course of an orbit. Question C. I got you. Um all right, so which column tells you how much a planet orbits deviates from a deviates from a perfect circle? For each planet, use that column to decide whether you would expect its average surface temperature to vary over the course of its orbit and why. Can you guess which column tells you the deviation from a perfect circle? That's a key term in this class. Squishiness. Eccentricity. Very good. Why don't we take a look at what planets have high eccentricities? Do I have that here? Oh, right. Famously, this table doesn't have eccentricities because it sucks. Um, let's see if we can find the eccentricity in one of the other tables. Oh, here we go. Which planets will have eccentricities that contribute to seasonal variation? Axis tilts determine seasons only so long as the orbits are circular. If the orbits are non-circular, you can actually get seasonal variation due to changing distance from the sun. Which planets might have seasonal variations 
due to changing distance from the sun. Sorry. Which planets have high eccentricities? Um, Mercury. One more. Um, Mars. Mars. Yeah, nine percent doesn't sound like a lot, but compared to the other planets, Mars is a little bit more eccentric in orbit, and that leads to some very important seasonal changes on Mars. So it turns out that Mercury and Mars, also Pluto and Eris, even though they're not officially planets, Mercury, Mars, Pluto, and Eris have high eccentricities that affect seasons. And that wraps up question 40. Andrew, let me know when you're done. I'm so, all done. All right, so I'm ready. So, so, Brendan. Yeah. So, based off axis tilt, Mercury doesn't have seasons, but based off eccentricity, it says that it should. Right. So, Mercury drifts <laughs> closer. And, it's pretty funny how that works. Um, Mercury is not like Earth. Earth has its changing axis tilt and the angle of the sunlight is what's causing seasons. But on Mercury, it's literally the physical distance getting closer and farther away that changes the surface temperature. Now, Mercury is just a lump of rock with no atmosphere. So what you're really affecting is you're affecting how hot the subsolar side is. The side that's sitting underneath the sun on Mercury is the sunlight's beating down on it and it's very hot. But the far side of the planet is in darkness and it's super cold. So Mercury actually just has a crazy hot temperature on the one side and a crazy cold temperature on the other. Without an atmosphere, you're just measuring the temperature of surface rock. So not as interesting as a planet like Earth or Mars or Venus that has an atmosphere. But point noted. Um, okay, the next question is a real, a real easy one. Sean, do you have access to those problems? Can you read us one? I do not. So here's what you do, Sean. You watch my moves. You go to your blackboard, which you should have up. You go to homework eight, chapter seven PDF. You right click and you open in a new tab. And then you can read me Number 44. Can you do that for me? Yeah, just give me one second. Forty-four. Size comparisons. How many Earths could fit inside Jupiter? Assuming you could fill up all the volume. How many Jupiters could fit inside the sun? And the equation of the volume of a sphere is V equals four thirds pi r cubed.
How should we do this? What's the best way to do this problem? The radius of Jupiter is 71,000 kilometers. The radius of Earth is 6,400 kilometers. How should I do this problem? This is easy. What do I do? <coughs> Just plug, plug the radius of Jupiter in, find its volume, and then plug Earth's radius in, and then find its volume, and then divide. That's one way to do it, Joel, and that's a very logical, reasonable thing to do. But there's an even slicker, easier way. Dimensional analysis? Not exactly. We don't need dimensional analysis here because we're taking ratios as long as they're in the same units. Joel. You, oh, yeah. Wouldn't you just divide Jupiter's rate, uh, radius by Earth's and then plug you it can't in? Simply divide. Well, we have to be careful here, Sean. If, if it was just four thirds pi r, then you could do that. But mm -hmm. r cubed means it's more complicated. <clears throat> The idea that I had, which is different than both of your ideas, is that you we You divide would... Jupiter by Earth's radius and then cube it? That actually turns out to what, it, what, what we have to do. So watch this. Let's write it symbolically. The volume of Jupe, in other words, we're going to divide it first over the volume of Earth, would be 4 thirds pi radius of Jupiter cubed over four thirds pi radius of Earth cubed. And obviously the four third pi's cancel out. That leaves you radius of Jupiter cubed over radius of Earth cubed. But as Joel just realized, we can factor out the cube giving us the radius of Jupiter divided by the radius of Earth and then cube that. And that's the fastest, simplest way to do it. So in other words, 71,000 kilometers over 6,400 kilometers and then cube. Go ahead and do that for me. What'd you get, uh, Matt? Just read it out to me, or just say it out to me. 1,365.3. Two sig figs, buddy. Don't get crazy on me here. Oh, okay. So 1.3 no, times. It's not, no, science. I'm not asking for scientific notation. I'm asking for rounding. Rounding is oh. not. Okay, so, uh, oh, two. All right, so uh, 1,400. Thank you. 1,400 Earths will fit into Jupiter. Okay. When you're done, Sean, read us B. Bless you. Thank you. Sorry, um, that's a bit extreme. B says, how many Jupiters could fit inside the sun? Okay, so the radius of the sun 
is 700,000 kilometers. From our previous result, we can see that the volume of the sun over the volume of Jupiter will go as the radius of the sun to the radius of Jupiter cubed, 700,000 kilometers over 71,000 kilometers cubed. If we call that 70, because we're feeling lazy, then basically that ends up being 10 cubed or 1,000 Jupiters would fit inside the sun. And that's just doing a sort of order of magnitude estimate. That knocks out two questions. Joel, 45. Hold on, wait. Andrew, can I erase? Uh, no, not yet. All right, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay, Joel, uh, 45, if you don't mind. Uh, 45, asteroid orbit. Uh, Ceres, the largest asteroid, has an Orbital semi-major axis of 2.77 AU. Uh, use Kepler's third law to find its orbital period. Compare your answer with the value in table 7.1 and name the planets that orbit just inside and outside Ceres orbit. What's Kepler's uh, third law? is Kepler's uh... third law. You can't tell me Kepler's third law? That's P squared cool. equals eight cubed. Yeah, what the hey, guys? P squared equals eight cubed. <clears throat> All right, so what do I do? Uh, so the A would be 2.77. And thus P would be the square root. Yep of 2.77 AU cubed. Go ahead and punch, oh shoot. Go ahead and punch that up for me.
What you got, guys? Come on, let's not stretch this out. The sooner you answer, the sooner we get this done. Um, Bella, you can just read it out to me. You can just tell me what your answer is. Bella, how many sig figs you want to keep? Two. No, three. Exactly. So I got 4.61. And they said to compare it to the books. So uh, I just changed my sweater and lost my marker. Oh, no, that's because it's here. Uh -huh. OK, can you say that again, Bella? 4.61. Units? AU. Oh. Uh, this is a period. Years. Yeah. The secret units of this formula are, are years squared per AU cubed. But no one writes that because it would be too annoying to do that. So you're just supposed to remember that the units come out to be years. Let's see what that stupid table had. Oh, they don't have series in there, will they? Well, let's check Wikipedia. Um, I'm assuming it's going to be the same thing. <clears throat> uh, yeah, it said uh, 16, 1,682. Yeah. So, well, they got 4.60. Notice there's there's some uncertainty in the last sig fig because, because of rounding here. They give us 2.77. So a small rounding error there at the thousandths place led to a small error there. So, you know, okay, so 4.61. Here's how a scientist would write that plus or minus 0.01 years, <laughs> meaning there's some uncertainty in the last digit there. OK, uh, what planet is inner and what planet is outer to, to Ceres? That should be obvious, right? What planet is the nearest one interior to Ceres? Which one is the farthest, uh, the planet uh, just outside the orbit of Ceres? You should know from that first set of notes that I had on the board today that were from last class. If you can't remember, you're going to have to look it up. That's how it works. Um, would it be Mercury and Venus for inner planets? No. Or no, that all. Oh, We're I'm asking about the planet interior to Ceres and exterior to Ceres. Uh, In interior would be Mars and exterior would be Jupiter? Right. Because Ceres is in the asteroid belt. Remember, I told you that Ceres is the king of the asteroids. Ceres is in the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt is between 2 AU and 3 AU. All right, three down, two to go. Making some good progress here, guys.
Andrew, are you done? Yeah, I'm done. I'm erasing. Matt, uh, can you do us 46, please? Yes. Right now, or do you want me to wait? Um, um, right now. OK. Uh, density classification. Calculate the density of a hypothetical planet in our solar system with a mass of 5.97 to the 25th kilograms and a radius of 12,800 kilometers. Give your answer in units of grams per cubic centimeter based just on its density. Would we consider it the largest terrestrial planet or the smallest Jovian planet? Explain. Uh, what was that radius again? I got a little behind. Yes, so the uh, hypothetical planet in our solar system with the mass of 5.97 uh, to the 25th kilograms and a radius of 1,200, not 1,200, 12,800 kilometers. Okay, so I can't remember how we do this. What do we do? We have to find the density. Uh, dimensional analysis first. Yeah. Uh, and what do we want to convert? Kilograms into grams and kilometers into centimeters. Okay. So let's do that real quick. The mass, 5.97, just like we did in class today, times 10 to the 25th kilograms. What's our conversion factor to grams? One thousand grams. Oops, sorry. So what's our mass then? Five point nine seven times ten to the twenty eight. And now we'll do the radius. What's our conversion factor to centimeters? One thousand centimeters to one kil kilometer. False. You missed an important thing today, Joel, where we worked this out. No, it's ten thousand, because one meter equals that. Or Not ten thousand. Thousand meters equals equals. How am I going to that? Class. One hundred thousand. One hundred thousand, or ten to the five centimeters per kilometer. And we worked that out today. Uh, if you watch the earlier part of the lecture, uh, you'll see how we proved that. So it's ten to the fifth centimeters per kilometer. So what does that give us for centimeters then? So 128 times 10 to the six. Not exactly. I got 1.28 to the times 10 to the 10th power. Nope. I heard all bunch of wrong answers so far. I got 1.2 to the 10th. No. You it's one, one point, oh, it's 1. 1.3 times 10 to the two. Nine. Yeah, look, guys, you don't know how to put 10 to the 5 into your calculator. So let me show you what you're doing. You guys are sitting there going, oh, 10 to the power of 5. I'm going to go 10 exp5. <clears throat> That's 10 to the power of 6, guys. Exp includes the 10. 10 to the 5 is 1 times 10 to the 5. This is how you put in 10 to the 5. 1 exp5, okay? That's 100,000. Once again, if you type 10 EXP5, that is 1 million, 10 to the 6, right? Stop doing that. It's 1.28. You don't even need a calculator. Times 10 to the 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. You shouldn't have even needed a calculator for that. All right, now let's calculate the density. Don't do that on the test. You're going to screw up. 
density is three times the mass, 5.97 times 10 to the 28 grams over four times pi times 1.28, 10 to the nine centimeters cubed. Okay, we practiced this earlier. Let's make sure you can all do it. <coughs> Two sig figs will suffice for me. I can't believe how close this election is. This nation is completely polarized. Uh, so many people, it's split right down the middle. It's crazy. Um, okay, so what do you guys got for me? Cam, Cam, show that to me again. Wrong. I got 6.8. Good. 6.8 what? Grams per cubic centimeter. Good. Cam, what did you do wrong? I'm not sure. Cam, I, I am. I think, I, I think it's because I divided. There. You should have hit divide. I did hit divide. There's no me, way. You got 10 to the power again. of 57. Your power of 10 was 10 to the power of 57. That could only have happened if you multiplied by that. I'm going to try again just to make sure. Divide by four, divide by pi, divide by 1.28, exp9 cube equals. What kind of planet is okay. this? Terrestrial or I got it right. Cool. It has to do with the cube, I think. Oh, all right. Is this a uh, terrestrial or Jovian? Terrestrial. Yeah, this is a very metallic terrestrial, if you ask me. In other words, we don't have to see a planet to know what kind of planet it is. When we discover planets outside of our solar system, if we can estimate their mass and their radius, we can guesstimate whether or not they are terrestrial or Jovian. If they're terrestrial, we may want to send a spaceship there in the future so that we can find aliens who will want to hang out with us. That's four down, one to go. Jake, you're going to take us home. Does anyone need more time on this? I'm all set. All right, I'm erasing. Forty-nine, planetary parallax. Suppose observers at Earth's oh, north pole. Jake, do you mind yeah. if I interrupt you for a second? Because this is a little bit of more confusing a problem. Before I even let you read, I want us to all draw the diagram together, including you, Jake, and then we'll read. Okay. If you guys remember, on Monday, Joel asked me a cool question, and the cool question was about what would it look like if Earth passed in front of the sun as seen from Mars? And we saw that Earth would do something called a transit. Oops. Let's look at a transit of Venus. During a transit of Venus, we watch the shadow of Venus move across the disk of the sun over the course of an hour. Depending on what kind of a transit you get, you'll see something like this, where the shadow of Venus will move across the Earth. This was one of the first ways we learned how to measure 
the distance from Earth to the sun by using the small angle formula and having two different observers at two different places on Earth observe the position of Venus and compare it. So let's draw the picture together. Over here, uh, over here we have the sun. And over here, we have Earth. Let me put that a little bit lower. And somewhere in between is the planet Venus. And the observers were not exactly at the North Pole and South Pole, but this would be the most extreme version of the problem. Actually, the first people who did it was, uh, I think, Jeremiah Horrocks, and he was only observing it with his friend from two different positions in England. So it was a much more challenging measure. One observer on the North Pole sees the shadow of Venus over here. The other observer at the South Pole sees the shadow of Venus up there. And as Jake is about to read to us, they can get the angle between the two positions by comparing it to the disk of the sun. The goal is to estimate the distance between Earth and Venus so that we can then estimate the distance between Venus and the sun. Remember that the radius of Earth is here. <coughs> okay. Now, uh, Jake, when you're ready. So planetary parallax, suppose observers at Earth's North Pole and South Pole use a transit of the sun by Venus to discover that the angular size of Earth as viewed from Venus would be 62.8 arc seconds. Earth's radius is 6,378 kilometers. Estimate the distance between Venus and Earth in kilometers and AU. Compare your answer with information from the chapter. In other words, they measure an angle of 62.8 arc seconds between these two spots, but they know by alternate interior angles that this angle has to also be 62.8 arc seconds. And now we're going to use the small angle formula part two. Let's call the diameter or the size of Earth S. S, the diameter of Earth, is twi twice the radius of Earth. And by the small angle formula part two, that's alpha times the distance over 206, 265 arc seconds. Do you guys know how to solve this equation for distance? Who can do that in their head? What will the distance equal? Can anyone do that? No? There isn't a soul out there who can solve for D.
just flip this up and flip that down. Geez, guys, take an algebra one class or something, eh? It's, this is important to be able to do this. Times 206, 265 arc seconds divided by alpha. We can plug in our values. <clears throat> Two times 6378 kilometers. All right, I'm running out of space. I'm going to I'm going to take this party upstairs here. The distance is 2 times 6378 kilometers times 206265 arc seconds over 62.8 arc seconds. Solve that up for me. You want two or three sick figs? Three. Forty-one point nine. Eight. Not you. Uh -huh. Not you. Wait, 41.9, you're missing something here. Oh, uh, 41.9 times 10 to the six, sorry. Yeah. What are my units? Kilometers. Let's convert that to AU next. What's the conversion factor from kilometers to AU? One AU is equals one fifty thousand times one fifty fuck. Ten to the six. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Six is a million. Okay, that's a million. A million. Six zeros. Okay, punch him up. Three sick pigs. Just read it to me, Cam. Three sig figs. I don't look at your calculator right now. Zero point three. No, I want three um, sig figs, please. Oh, zero point two eight. I want three sig figs. That's only two. Oh, okay, zero point two seven nine AU. Now that's the distance from Venus to Earth, right? How do I find the distance from Venus to the sun? <clears throat> Say you're Jeremiah Horrocks and you just discovered that Venus is 0.279 AU away. Do you now know how far the sun is from Venus? Yes. How how far away? Well, if Earth is one AU from the Sun, you subtract point two seven nine from one AU. That's an awesome idea. Go ahead and do that. 
0.721. Let's see how this estimate compares with the one from our table today. Share screen. Um, where is that table? Distance from the sun. Look at that. Venus to Earth, 0.723. So in the book. Plus or minus 0.002. Um, here's how we make that a percent error. <laughs> to make a percent error, you do the difference divided by the true answer. So what you do is your percent error you just subtract the two numbers, 0.723 minus 0.721, and then you divide it by 723. What's your percent error? Two tenths of a percent, point zero zero two. Three tenths of a percent. Oh yeah, point. Yeah, because it's zero zero two seven six. That's pretty damn good. <clears throat> and that's your percent error. And that concludes homework number eight. Woo! All right, we crushed that one, guys. We crushed it. Now, uh, y'all take care of yourself and uh, keep an eye on those election results. I'm gonna try to catch up on your homework and grading as soon as possible. So please uh, submit this today so I can do that in a timely way. I have Wait, is there more on the bottom? It just says error, but I wrote it badly. Let me know when you're good, Andy, so I can stop the recording and such. And no looting and rioting based I'm on the election results. Everyone stay cool. Or try to, anyways. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to uh, stop the recording now for the purposes of the video link.